So if you thought that meant that you were getting out of a sermon, think again. <laughs> One of the first things I learned about covenant when my own call began here, oh God, I have to say it, 30 years ago this summer, one of the first and most forceful things I learned is that this is a place that has been an essential part of the meaning of the word home for many people for whom it had not been easy to find any such place where their spirits could be welcome and at peace and nourished. I couldn't have known when I began how deeply I would come to feel that myself over those 12 years. Today, that memory is very fresh, as for me, coming back is like coming home. And I thank you from the heart of my heart for the welcome and the peace and the nourishment that you have held as hallmarks of your ministry on this street corner and that you landed in the marrow of my bones. Many of you, I know, are coming home this morning from a retreat, time that you used for discovering and contemplating many kinds of blessings that make you who you are and also perhaps call you further on into being who you have not yet been or might hope to be. Knowing that some of you spent yesterday that way got me remembering a covenant retreat of maybe 20-some years ago when we played around a bit with a similar idea. We invited everybody to bring a strand of something. A scrap of ribbon, maybe, or a piece of yarn, a string, a strip of recording tape, anything long and thin. And to find in it some aspect of whatever they brought, the color, maybe, or the texture, or the length, or the history, or the use, to find in that strand a representation of something precious and distinctive about themselves. When everyone got together, we brought out a wooden frame that we'd made that was fitted out with a warp and weft, and I can never remember which one of those is which, fitted out with a web of plain twine and we invited everyone, one by one, to say something about how their strand held or showed or stood for something of themselves as they wove it back and forth into the web of twine in the frame. We called the retreat Frameworks. And the thing we wanted to wonder about together as we looked at all those interwoven colors and different textures and dangling curls and loose ends. The thing we wanted to wonder about was this. What is the framework within which all of these interwoven lives are held? How do we understand what it is that holds us together, that enables us to cohere, that makes a whole out of such a variety of strands? How do we name it? How do we take care of it? How do we need to change it? How does it need to change us? Well, I wasn't with you yesterday, of course, as some of you pondered the gifts and blessings that animate and inspire covenant today. And of course, not all of you were there either. But I want to ask another sort of framework question about the brightly woven and complexly textured tapestry of gifts and blessings that spread out on the warp and weft of these pews on this pudding stone loom. The question is this, what lies beyond the visible spectrum of gifts? 
the gifts that we can see in ourselves and each other with the naked eye, what can't we see in ourselves, in each other, through the lens of our assumptions and our certainties? What gifts might come into focus, in particular through the lens of generosity that you're trying on during this season of ingathering in your life together? Well, I knew that I wanted to wonder about this with you pretty much from the time that Julie and I first talked about my visiting you on the Sunday of your retreat weekend. So I was carrying that wondering with me as Peter and I embarked on a great trip to the Mediterranean a few weeks ago. And while we were in Rome, in a dark corner of a small church on a back street, I sort of stumbled across the painting that you see reproduced on the front cover of your bulletin. And true to form, that picture helped me to find about a thousand words for wondering about this with you. I promise I'll only speak a few of them. Here goes. The painting on the front cover of your bulletin is by Caravaggio, a painter in the Italian Renaissance who was born a few years after the death of Michelangelo and whose dates are roughly the same as Shakespeare's. The title is The Calling of St. Matthew. Caravaggio is known particularly for the way he uses light and just as much uses the absence of light. I think you can see that even in this place where light and the absence of light are part of the meaning of the room. There are a few things I hope you notice as you look at the picture. You see the shaft of light coming in from an unseen upper window on the right. How it picks out the faces of the people at the table across the room. And you see how the light just barely pulls the face of Jesus out of the shadows too, near the upper right-hand corner of the picture. The path of the light follows the same trajectory right to left as Jesus' arm as it gestures toward the center of the picture. And I want you to look at that hand. You've seen that hand before. Here's an approximate imitation of the pose. It's the hand that brings things to life. And just like the hand on Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling, this hand has focused its energy on something, on someone in the room. Christian tradition has come to understand that Levi, son of Alphaeus, and Matthew are two names for the same disciple of Jesus. This is one of those perplexing scriptural details that we're stuck with as a result of having four Gospels, four lenses to peer through as we watch these stories unfold, which sometimes refract the details of the narrative like a cubist painting. It's not unlike Peter and Simon and Cephas, which are all three names for the same fisherman, who, by the way, appears in this painting. He's the hulking figure at the far right wearing a tan cloak with his back to us, oddly using up most of the light and visibility that might otherwise fall on Jesus, who, of all things, is behind him. But if the Gospels leave some shadow between the names Matthew and Levi, there is no ambiguity at all about the employment of that one. He is a tax collector, a group generally despised by most ordinary Jews of Jesus' time for their cooperation with the oppressive regimes of Herod and Caesar. 
They set up their toll booths, those tax collectors, at roadsides and thoroughfares and even by the lakeside where they could shake down passers-by for the revenue on which the empire depended. And they were always suspected of extortion and bribery and feathering their own nests. Matthew, Levi, is the bearded figure at the center of the group of people on the left side of the picture. Caravaggio has dressed him in the velvet hat and tunic of an affluent gentleman of his time. His well-upholstered friends, plumed and doubleted and stockinged, are helping him count the coins he's collected. The shaft of light seems to confirm all the assumptions about who this person is. But by the strange light of the moment, Jesus is seeing something that is, well, beyond the social spectrum of everyone else in the room, including Matthew himself. Matthew feels Jesus' gaze, gaze, feels the energy coming from that outstretched hand, but he can't believe that the focus could possibly be on him. He points lamely to the distracted colleague next to him. Surely you must mean someone else. Surely you can't be looking at me. Before we leave Caravaggio, let's notice something else about the painting. Something that's not there. So for some of us, it's harder to see, though probably for most of us, it's pretty glaring. Beyond the edges of the visible social light that the painter used to tell the story were the women who we know followed, even though the pages of scripture tell us next to nothing about the moments when they were called. Beyond the edges of the visible social light by which the painter saw this scene were all the non-Italians, the non-straight, the non-affluent, many of whom would probably have had an easier time than Matthew did, feeling the news that Jesus was proclaiming, release to the captive, sight to the blind, relief to the oppressed, to feel that news landing in their bones. I like to think that maybe their presence in this painting is in the light that's coming from the outside, from beyond. The women and the poor and the outcast already in the movement, already kindling some of the light that Matthew was being asked to step out into. Or maybe it's their voices from the shadows beyond the edges of the light that Caravaggio could use. Their voices that we can't hear because we're looking, not listening, which we do so much. Their voices saying, me too, here am I, send me, I'm in. Scripture doesn't tell us much about what it was like to be on the inside of that small circle of those who, each for their own reasons, decided to get up from what they were doing and follow Jesus. When the ranks of the fishermen were joined by one of the wealthy collaborators whom they absolutely abhorred, by whom they were used to being shaken down, well, it's probably no surprise that before long a couple of them, James and John, came to Jesus privately and asked him to choose them, not the tax collector, as his favorites. We assume that as Jesus' teachings began to sink in, perhaps they all started succumbing to the climate of love and respect eventually, and put aside the simmering animosities and rivalries that were baked into the landscape that they'd all come from. But you know, Scripture doesn't tell us that. Scripture leaves us to imagine the incremental weaving together of Christian community out of the ragtag, adversarial lot of them. 
and it leaves us to figure out how to experience that weaving ourselves. But Scripture does tell us, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that Jesus saw valuable gifts in someone who looked like an enemy, an adversary, someone who couldn't imagine having anything that Jesus would have needed or wanted. And Jesus called precisely that one to step up. That gesture in hand speaks volumes. It asks, do we really know what gifts we have? What blessings we've been blessed by? Do we really know what gifts others have? Or how ready they are to bless us? So here's what I'm wondering. Who is out there beyond the edge of the spectrum of visible social light that the lenses we wear every day enable us easily to recognize as our allies? We know who those other people are. These days we denounce them in the harshest terms we can find. Queer these days. Have you heard the kind of animus that's audible in the dripping scorn on the voices at Matthew's house that night at dinner, calling the people there tax collectors and sinners? In the climate of toxic polarization of these times, there is no question in most people's minds whose assumptions put them outside the circle of life. But Scripture does give us a way to imagine what it was like when the climate of Jesus' company and the warp and weft of his teaching started weaving people together. Mark tells us that after Levi or Matthew or whatever his name is, stood right up from his tax table and followed Jesus back out into the strange light coming from outside. They shortly ended up at a dinner at Levi's house. The room was filled with all those tax collectors and sinners. And the general volume and energy of the gathering were loud enough to attract the attention of the scrupulous Pharisees. In fact, we can imagine, or at least we can hope, that they even heard Jesus' voice, the laughter rising above the general tide. Those Pharisees ask, why does he eat with people like that? But maybe in their heart of hearts what they mean is, how is it that all of them get to put aside their troubles and enjoy each other so much? And the life of this congregation has given us a way, too, to imagine what it's like when we look beyond the visible spectrum. In the mid-1980s, when some at Covenant began to see the way the light was catching the faces of the poor in Nicaragua, there is no question, no question at all, about the way most every Nicaraguan of that time would have had occasion to see the likes of us in the United States, sitting at our tables, counting our coins, marshalling our guns. The truth is that the shoe has been on the other foot. And when our relationship with Dulce Nombre de Jesus began, any Nicaraguan could see any one of us as a tax collector, a truly impossible ally, an adversary to keep a close eye on. that you have found your way into the interwoven community that you are today. Indeed, that you have banqueted together in their houses and they in your houses and feasted all together at this table of all tables is a testament to the wonder of what is possible when that hand, that hand, 
gestures and says, why don't you come and be a part of this too? You with your dirty hands, you with your empty hands, you with your hands ready and willing to heal and to carry and to build the reign of God. Don't get me wrong, I said I wanted to wonder about this with you, not because I figured out how to do it, but because I haven't. I don't think there is any more vexing spiritual or moral problem in our time than the problem of how to see the people to whom our outrage has blinded us. The people from whom the wounds we have sustained have estranged us, let alone how to imagine making common cause with them. How on earth do we rise to the call to exercise the toxic polarization of this time? What is the ministry of reconciliation now? And how shall we resist the instinct to figure that we don't have anything to offer to it? That surely someone else will step up to it? What gifts can't we see? Gifts and blessings in ourselves, in each other, in them. Through the lens of our assumptions and our certainties. That we might see if we really tried on the lens of generosity. It's because I don't know how to do that that I bring this vexing question here to this very particular place, this congregation, this loom, I learned from you that this is a safe place, in fact, as safe a place as maybe there is in this world at this time, to ask the hardest questions. But I also learned here that we should expect a knock at the door as we sit counting our assumptions, making little stacks of our moral certainties. Many times I had the experience with you here of looking up to see or feel or know that a hand was gesturing from the shadows, that it was full of life, that hand, and ready to embrace, but ready to beckon to. Many times I had the experience of saying or thinking, what? These empty hands? <laughs> <laughs>